Welcome to the Grand Debate, June 16, 2015. The four candidates for the position of Grand Chief of the Mohawk Council of Gaknawage have been invited to join us at K103 over the next two hours to debate the issues and face the fifth estate. All of the Gaknawage media is represented here tonight. The Eastern Door, Gaknawage 411, Yuriwase, Gaknawagenews.com, and Kanadagu TV. The rules for the debate are as follows. Each candidate has signed a waiver agreeing to refrain from using improper or disrespectful language on air and to conduct themselves in a respectful manner. Under no circumstances will the guests be permitted to use the names of private citizens and or businesses in a slanderous or hurtful manner. This is a standard K103 guest waiver form for going on air, by the way. The journalists here this evening have signed the waiver as well. The debate is open only for any officially declared candidates for the position of Grand Chief. The candidates now will be given two minutes each to introduce themselves. The order was decided beforehand when the four chose randomly from a hat. Next, we will open up to questions from our journalists. The person to whom the question is directed will have 90 seconds to respond. Any rebuttal or follow-up from other candidates will be allotted one minute. Another 45 seconds for a second rebuttal from the original respondent, if need be. The debate will end at 8 p.m. sharp tonight. My name is Paul Grafe, the news director here at K103.7 FM. Our panel of journalists tonight from the Eastern Door, editor and publisher Steve Bonspiel. From Mohawk TV, Gunawage411.com media, executive producer Regan Jacobs. From Yoriwase and Gunawagenews.com, editor and publisher Greg Horn and from Ganadagu TV, channel coordinator Lauren McCumber. If there's time, we will take calls off air and screen, screen questions from the public. And now we would like to welcome our candidates in no particular order, Keith Mayo, Lloyd Phillips, Joe Norton, and Mike DeLille. Gentlemen, thank you all for coming in this evening. Thank you, Paul. Again, we have chosen randomly from a hat, and each candidate will get two minutes to introduce themselves. And first up, Choosing the number one, Joe Norton. Joe, you now have two minutes. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm glad that everybody is taking the opportunity to listen to what we have to say this evening. Um, Joseph Tuguido Norton is my name, and my parents were Hazel Hemlock and Peter Norton. Um, I guess from um, from my point of view, I've uh, always been a Ganawaga Rono and always will be, no matter where my travels have taken me. And it's quite extensive that uh, that I have traveled all over the world. And um, my heart has always been here, and I was always concerned about where things were going and what was going to happen in the future. I have family here, I have grandchildren brothers and sisters, and they also have a, quite a wide range of children and grandchildren, so on and so forth. Um, and in one way or another, I guess we all have some sort of relation and connection to each other. So it is my concern that, you know, leadership in this community has to acknowledge that, has to be aware of that, has to work towards maintaining the uh, level of comfort, the peace and security for our people. Uh, no matter what happens uh, into the future, we will always continue to have the same kind of situation where the non-native governments and people out there will want more and more from us, so we have to stay vigilant. We have to be on top of things. That's basically where I stand. Well, Joe, thank you very much. That was Joe Norton leading off, again, picking out of a hat. Second up is <coughs> Keith Mayo. Keith, you have two minutes. Keith Mayo. My mother is Marina Morris. Father is Stuart Mayo. I had four kids. I have two surviving. I have been a traditional person all my life. I made it my duty and responsibility to maintain our cultural identity. Whether I was in Phoenix, Los Angeles, wherever it was, I would make it my duty to be home for any of the four sacred ceremonies. Whenever there was a situation of grave importance, I would travel from New York, from 
Columbus, Ohio, wherever it was, to get home because they said the bank council was doing things against our people. So I took my responsibility to be there whether I was paid or not. No one put bread and butter on my table except me all my life. I've been an iron worker for 42 years, going on 43. And all that I've done, recording band meetings extensively throughout the years, and I have those tapes on hand if anybody wishes to hear them. That is my identity, that is my responsibility and commitment to the people of Ganawage. Never have I taken a dime from anyone here in Ganawage. You can have it next. <laughs> Keith Mayo. Next up, again, choosing randomly from the hat, was Lloyd Phillips. Lloyd, you now have two minutes. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, good to be here. First time experience having a long live debate. My name is Lloyd Phillips. Lloyd Omnigette Phillips, member of the Turtle Clan. I'm 45 years old. I'm married to uh, Wendy Walker for, uh, for nearly 24 years now. My father is Stuart Phillips, many people know him, as well as uh, my mother is uh, Alice Mantor Phillips. I think I've shown throughout the years in my life that I'm dedicated to the community. Now I have 16 years experience on council, taking on many major portfolios. I think now it's an evolution in my uh, political career, if you want to call it that, to move on to the next level of... Uh, of Grand Chief. You know, I believe leadership is just about as much of who you are as a person, as about as your experience. And like I said, I think I've shown the people that uh, uh, I'm a respectful person. I think I have the respect of the community and I, I do have uh, the experience required to do the job. For me, it's about moving forward. It's about a collective vision and your support on Saturday and the continued support thereafter we could prosper as a community. Yamagoa. Thank you, Lloyd Phillips. Lastly, Mike DeLille. Mike, you now have two minutes. Yeah, well, Paul. Say you've got a wage. Mike DeLille Jr., you're a Grand Chief for the past 11 years, six years previous to that as a member of council. It's been an honor to serve the community for 17 years. I can't believe it's been that length of time. Uh, a lot has been accomplished. I've worked alongside all of these three gentlemen beside me tonight uh, to varying degrees of success, and I have no qualms in saying that. Uh, Kanawagi is a very demanding community, looking for jurisdiction, looking to exercise it in every possible way. I believe we've done some of those things, not only in the past 11 years, but for long before that, and want to continue to push and strive for Kanawagi exercising jurisdiction, being recognized by outside territories and other governments and communities. We deal at a national level, a provincial level, a national level, and at a community level. I believe that this job requires capacity, responsibility, integrity, and many of the other adjectives that most people understand about leadership and, and, and link to leadership. I'm a family man, I'm a grandfather now, two beautiful grandchildren. That's the reason why I want to maintain this position and responsibility. Our, our future generations require hope. I believe we're on the cusp of a lot of good things that will ensure our future, their future, and the hope of Gunawage as a whole and collective. So it's been 11 trying years. I'm seeking three more. Hopefully, I still have the support of the community and looking to lead continuing on. Yangoa. Mike DeLille, thank you very much. We have now heard the opening statements from each of the candidates. And now what we will do is open the floor to questions from our journalists. The way we are set up here at K103, and by the way, we are streaming live on uh, the Eastern Door site, yoriwaseganawagenews.com, Mohawk411, as well as uh, Ganadagu TV and all will be showing this later on as well. We are going to go in. We are in Studio A, our main studio, for those of you who know the new building that's almost a year old now, with the four Grand Chief candidates and myself. Our journalists are in Studio B. There is uh, right through the glass, and so we can all see each other. Now, first up, we are going to go to Lauren McCumber from Ganadagu TV for the first 
question. Mike, if you can put your headphones on, because I believe this is going to be addressed to everyone in the room. Lauren? Uh, yes, it will. Sego uh, Zewaguego. So this question is for all of you. What is your stance on evicting non-natives from the community? What we'll do here is we will reverse the order that you all just went in. So Mike DeLille, you are up first and you have 90 seconds. I believe in Mohawk law. I believe in Mohawk custom and tradition. I believe that we've been maintaining that for as long as I've been around and been told by father and, and others in the community that non-natives cannot reside here. I think it has to be done peacefully. I know what's happened in the early 70s and looking not to repeat actions uh, as such, but it's been very difficult over the past, not only year, but uh, at least 33 years since the moratorium was put in place. But, but I am a strong supporter of non-natives not being able to live in Ganawage. Uh, eviction is a strong word, as we've called it in the past, it's not entitlement to reside. Uh, people will call it semantics, but I believe there is a difference. Eviction sounds extremely negative. I think non-eligibility and non-compliance in terms of residing in the community has to do with their rights or, or not having rights to be able to live here. So uh, I believe that Ganawage is for Ganawage only. Thank you, Mike. Mike DeLille, now Lloyd Phillips, as you spoke third before, you will be second this time. Lloyd, you have 90 seconds. Well, the... Um Certainly the Mohawk membership uh, law is uh, something that has been a, a debate in the community for, uh, for some time. Not just recently, but this has been going on as long as I can remember. I've been involved in, in politics and community since, uh, since the 80s. I was a teenager involved in membership issues. Um, I support the uh, 2003 membership, uh, <laughs> membership law that has been put into place. Uh, and in there, one of the provisions does mention that non-natives are not allowed to reside in the territory. Uh, I agree with Mike's statements there. Evictions is a very strong word. Uh, it is non-entitlement. And every letter that I had signed or I had supported talked about your non-entitlement according to Mohawk law. It's a matter of respecting the law. It's a matter of um, finding uh, you know, ways to maybe, if it's uh, convince individuals, uh, it's the right thing to do because it has been consistently the will of the people uh, time and time again. And moving forward, we're looking to reconfirm that will of the people, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, it'll, it'll maintain its, uh, its, its strength within the community, as that's been the overwhelming um, uh, sentiment since uh, the past several months. Lloyd, thank you very much. Lloyd Phillips, Keith Mayo, you're now on the clock, 90 seconds. People say that there is a law. In order to have a law, you have to have either a referendum, plebiscite, and those items don't exist. That was not ever on the, on the Richter scale. However, what was on the Richter scale is what we gave the world to recognize citizenship. When the Europeans came here, they were living blue bloods. Today, we are identifying one another by blue bloods. We are not blue bloods. How that so-called law stipulates any irregularities, disputes is going to be dealt with under the Ganyar de Goa, the great law of peace. That element has been removed by the present council. That element of the elders committee has been removed by the present council. And the one element that that committee had that the bank council will never have is a constitution. So all the legitimacy that that so-called law had under the elders was done away with. So if you're taking out the meat and the bones of that law, what do you have? You got nothing. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Joe Norton, since you spoke first, you will be last in this round. Yes, uh, the moratorium of 1981 was based on, and it, it, is, it was a moratorium only at that point in time, and basically it took what was oral, traditional belief, and it was codified. I know, I've, I wrote the first draft of it. And since that time, it's become uh, very clear that at no time anywhere Unless, um, unless, of course, there's small groups of people in the community who want to endorse non-native people living in Ganawagan. There was a, there was a cutoff point, 
and then there was a startup point in terms of the, the law itself and its application. Um, and you can cut it any way you want, left, right, or center, but it is the will and the, and the, um, the wishes of the community that things be held in that, uh, in, in that, uh, in that direction, in that um, process. And that's not going to change. It's only going to grow more clear as time goes on. Um, I'm a firm believer in that. I know I grew up in that milieu myself. My parents, my grandparents, who always said that non-native people do not have a place here uh, based on circumstance. And we clarified that circumstance in 1981 and moved forward. Of course, it's controversial. It will continue to be, but that's the way it is when you're building. Uh, your own sovereignty and your own wishes. Joe Norton, thank you. You've heard the first round of questions from our four Grand Chief candidates. The election will be held this coming Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. over at uh, Grunyanuha School. Joe Norton, Keith Mayo, Lloyd Phillips, and Mike DeLille, all our guests on the Grand Debate on K103.7 FM, joined by the Eastern Door, Mohawk TV, Gatnawage411.com, Yodiwase, Gatnawagenews.com, and Ganadago TV. For our next question, we are going to go to the editor and publisher of the Eastern Door, Steve Bonspiel. Steve? Thanks, Paul. A grassroots group took over land that's supposed to be given back to the community near Highway 30. What do you think of initiatives like this to address land claims and the repossession of Mohawk land? Are you addressing that to all of the candidates? Here? Yes. Okay, so we'll go back in uh, order again, but we'll mix it up a little bit this time. Uh, we'll begin with Keith. Keith Mayo, you'll have 90 <laughs> seconds. Well, first and foremost, why should we be trying to claim something that's already ours? One individual went out and he purchased land and the government of Canada gracefully confiscated it from him. Those 200 plus acres should be returned to that individual because it is rightfully his. He purchased that by what we call our income. So I look at legitimacy. Legitimacy, as I stated before, in regards to the scenery, Lake St. Louis, it was given to the Confederacy chiefs, Mohawk Nation chiefs, not to we did not have police chief, fire chief, or band council chiefs, counselors. Those were given, and those are the ones that are supposed to be there. And even the longhouses, not too long ago, gave a statement for the band councils to stay away from any land claims or misrepresenting the land. So we have to be more vigilant, and we have to remember what it is that we agreed upon as a people. Keith, thank you. Lloyd Phillips, you're up next and have 90 seconds. I think the overall movement uh, by a grassroots uh, group of people is, is positive. As we've seen in our community lately with, uh, with, with land claims, or we've seen with membership in recently, uh, grassroots is, is, is the cornerstone of our community. And uh, if there's any type of pressures that's needed to, on the outside uh, to, to reclaim or reinforce the political dialogue that's taking place, I think it's a positive thing. Uh, so uh, I, I, I would continue to support that because even in the past discussions, in the past few weeks, uh, past few months with council, we talked about taking actions ourselves uh, to put more pressure on governments and uh, to, again, to reinforce our political dialogue with some underground action. So uh, overall, it's uh, something I think is, is positive. And the dialogue has to continue between this grassroots movement and, 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 uh, and the council to ensure that we're, you know, we're complementing one another and not certainly going head to head. Thank you, Lloyd Phillips. Joe Norton, you're up next and have 90 seconds. Yeah, I don't have any problem with um, a grassroots movement, people wanting to go out and begin to uh, use, the, um, use that particular piece of land for farming. Uh, and uh, it shows initiative on the part of the community. It's supposed, this is supposed to be a community movement. I mean, uh, standing back and waiting for court settlements, suits from Shadagi, whoever it may be, is one thing, and use that as a reason not to do anything. But, um, you know, if, if I was involved, if I had it my way, I'd be out there right now digging up the ground and building whatever it is that needs to be built to force 
the issue because that's the only way things work. You'll sit here for years waiting for courts to settle things and the governments will use that as an excuse not to move. So I'm a, I'm a very aggressive person when it comes to things like that. And that's the kind of stuff we did before. We didn't wait. We forced the others to the table. You know, we weren't, uh, whether, we, whether they came there willingly or uh, dragged, dragged them there kicking and screaming, that's the way you do it. Uh, and I see it no other way. So I take my hat off to those young, young men and women who've gone out there and who've taken the opportunity to do what they're doing. And it's not a takeover of land either. They're part of Kahnawake, it's Kahnawake territory. It will always remain that way. So, you know, it's the beginning of something, something great as far as I'm concerned. Joe, thank you. Mike DeLell, 90 seconds. I support the initiative as well. Um, I'm not supportive in terms of it being a long-term resolution for the senior grievance or any other claim, as it's called, but I do support the actions that are taken, again, to utilize the land that are Gunawagi and legally at one point will become Gunawagi once again. Easier said than done in terms of just going out there and building. It's one thing to till the ground, plant seed, grow, and, and have some sustainable development, uh, which I applaud, but to involve industry to ensure that this can benefit the entire community in terms of economic growth, economic development, possible job creation, wealth creation, and stating our claim as a position within regional economic development is another thing. So although I applaud the actions uh, that are being taken place now by, by the grassroots group, there's still a lot of other work that needs to be done to ensure that once it is solidified legally, and I hate to use that term, uh, that it can continue to grow and prosper for the entire community. Thank you, Mike DeLille. Next up, we're gonna go back to the journalists in the other room and Lauren McCumber. Lauren? Hi, uh, I'd just like to take it back to the membership issue. And this question is for all of the candidates. Do you consider membership and residency separate issues? Okay, so we will uh, go back in, in order. Uh, Mike DeLille, again, you have 90 seconds to answer. I do look at them as separate issues. Um, we all know who members are. We all believe that uh, only Gunawagedono can reside within the territory, but this current issue of non-native non residency uh, is outside of that. We've recently reached out to traditional leadership within the community, uh, as Keith mentioned, coincidentally in terms of citizenship and greater good of community, trying to build something uh, out of the true authority, if you want to call it that, uh, Confederacy and Grand Council to hopefully have a respectful dialogue amongst council chiefs, band councillors, if you will, uh, traditional leadership within the community, and hopefully beyond Gunawagi as well, because this has longer term implications and bigger implications than only for Gunawagi. The court case is an issue about non-native residency, uh, unfortunately supported by some of our own people. Uh, we're dragged into that. It's not something that we wanted to see happen, but I believe they are separate. Uh, membership is going through, or at least the law is going through, amendment process once again, and uh, it will morph into something else based on community will and direction. Residency, I believe, will continue to be the issue uh, and the uh, fact that non-natives cannot reside here. So I see them as absolutely separate. Mike, thank you very much. Next up, oh, I lost my place, uh, <laughs> Joe Norton. Uh, residency has always been the issue, but it's tied into uh, into uh, membership, as we're calling it. Uh, whatever term is used later on, or or even in the interim, is still is still a, an issue that uh, is well debated in the community. Um, the residency part uh, has has been a long-standing matter, and something that needs to be uh, propped up occasionally, and we've seen it happen. Uh, every every few years it comes back and it's something that uh, we uh, we can expect into the future unless we come up with a way of resolving it the um, the leadership in the community has to take a very neutral stand in all of this in terms of of being the guiding light if we will for all of this not choosing up sides and being able to um, to caution our people to be very careful 
about demonstrations. People can demonstrate all they want. No reason why they shouldn't uh, and can't, but it also has to be very peaceful. We can't have this kind of uh, uh, ongoing pressurized situations that arise, and that's where the council themselves, not the peacekeepers, but the council themselves, the leadership, has to play that role as being the, uh, the guiding light for all of that. Joe Norton, thank you very much. Lloyd Phillips, you're on the clock. Okay, well, as, as we see, the current membership law includes both uh, membership and uh, residency <laughs> within the same law. And recent debates have taken place, and, and the question was raised, uh, should it be separate, uh, two separate laws? Because uh, deciding who is a member of Ganawaga is one thing. Deciding who could reside here, very, very closely linked, but it is so something that's, that's separate. Uh, so I do believe that we have to have um, a residency law into the future. But before we get to that point, we have to engage uh, with community. Uh, and listen to all sides of, of, the, of the, the debate and, and validate people's concerns and, and listen to their ideas and to see uh, what people are really saying. Before we look at getting into a referendum or, or drafting any type of law, we have to have that, that, uh, that grounding of uh, what the people are really saying. Because I had people on both sides of, of the argument uh, speak to me, as I'm sure many people in Kahnawagi have spoken uh, whether whether they they want to uh, you know they're they want to have somebody evicted from the territory they are they're afraid to be called racists or if they're very liberal in their thinking they're they're afraid to be you know criticized for that so we have to create a safe environment for people to be able to uh, voice their concerns and then from there move forward with whatever laws and policies are required. Lloyd Phillips, thank you very much. Keith Mayo, the last word on this one. You have ninety seconds. The greatest thing that any population could possibly hope for is to be open-minded open-minded does not put you in any particular camp however we have people running around out there bad-mouthing and so on making people's lives miserable over what is it 25 26 people on this uh, hit list well Realistically, those are right here. That number could be greater, could be smaller. But yet, we got 90,000 plus sitting here on the scenery, and nobody says jack about it. Canada has conceded on seven points that we were wrongfully done. We're talking about Ganawaga, but yet, no one deals with the big picture. We're all looking at the little scraps on the table instead of looking at the banquet. So we have to get our rack together as a people, as a little group that goes running around knocking on people's doors or smashing windshields. Well, we have to get our rack together real quick because we, according to this law, look like the south end of a horse going north. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. You are listening to The Grand Debate on K103.7 FM, shared equally amongst all of the Gatnawage journalism outlets, the Eastern Door, Mohawk TV, Yadiwase, and Ganadagu TV. For our next question, we are going to go to uh. Mohawk TV, Gatnawage411.com, executive producer, Regan Jacobs. Regan? Good evening, everybody. Um, my question is, community members have expressed the need for more economic development here in Gahnawage. However, there's been a lot of criticism against the Mohawk Council regarding getting into business, so to speak. Where do you stand on this issue and where do you draw the line? This is to all the candidates. For this round, I'd like to begin with uh, Lloyd Phillips. Lloyd, you have 90 seconds. Okay, well, the, the theme of economic development, job creation, revenue generation has been you know, the cornerstone of, of several elections. And uh, I agree, it's, we have not progressed to the uh, uh, extent most people hoped, to the extent I hope we have progressed and created revenue to the extent that, that we require as a community. And more importantly, you know, create the jobs because everybody uh, wants to be able to have a, a decent paying job to uh, take care of their family. Uh, 
that's why part of the things I put forward in the community was I, I think there's a need for an economic summit where we get everybody together to have the debates, uh, identify partnership possibilities, identify what the what the uh, the issues are stopping business development, whether it be political, financial, or otherwise, and get business people, politicians, economic development people, organizational people all together in the same room to have a discussion, have a debate, and try to strategize on a plan uh, moving forward. Thank you very much, Lloyd. Next up, Mike DeLille. I understand and agree with the sentiment in the community, hoping that economic development and uh, job creation would have progressed further than it has. Um, the Odenizakta has been in place, our Economic Development Commission, at least in law since 1999, in structure, I would say, probably since 2003, four, it takes time to build the, the organization and structure. And community has told council in the past to stay out of business. Uh, the ventures that we've tried, uh, at least in my stead, um, ha have not been successful. We understand community's motivation in, in terms of job creation, but it's twofold. Uh, I believe that wealth creation, uh, revenue generation sits, uh, I won't say idly by, but isn't necessarily the creature that will develop jobs for community. Um, we, we've seen some of the industries in the community do both, uh, revenue generation and wealth creation for individuals and also jobs for people within the community. We, we do have some excellent projects that are very close to fruition that will definitely create wealth for community, hopefully will create jobs for community, but again, to me, it goes to the capacity of the individuals. If, if we have trained, educated people to be able to take the jobs that are already here, instead of creating new ones, to me, that's the key. Stay in school and get the education necessary. Thank you, Mike. Next up, Keith Mayo. You have 90 seconds. Well, like it should be any place else, an administration should not be in business. And the proof is in the pudding. We've had tobacco businesses going here throughout the Ganawage for who knows how long, since the early 80s. But there has not been any movement whatsoever in protecting the industry. And even those that have been in the industry have not done anything to protect it. There's been safe measures that should have been taken. There's been conspiracy after conspiracy taking place to kill the tobacco trade. A Canadian, all he needs to do is go and get his license from Canada, and not an Indian. When it comes to an Indian, even if we're going to sell soap bubbles, they're going to find every which way to shut us on down just to get our so-called tax dollars. So either we get with it or we don't. The people have to wake up and we're running out of time. They're burning daylight awfully quick. Thank you, Keith. Next up, Joe Norton. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not a person to talk in philosophical terms or <clears throat> overall uh, issues. Since the, um, since the candidates' night, I've been approached by two different uh, entities in the Montreal region. One was to, uh, by a company called Maze Liner, to open up a, um, uh, a driving academy here uh, to, tra to train and teach our people how to become long distance truck drivers. Including that would be a shop, the maintenance, and all the things that go with that. Uh, and then we looked, I looked a little further into that and we could have a attached to that because of the different uh, modes of travel that we have here, the seaway, the bridges, and the, the roads, we could, we could begin to uh, expand into uh, bonded warehousing and a number of different sources attached to that sort of business. The other thing is, I was approached by a large company, construction company, who's going to be putting a bid on the, on the Champlain Bridge to get a part of the, a part of the, the work there. And uh, they've asked me to help them put together a consortium, a company here, in, in a joint venture with them to go and put a bid for uh, forward. So those are tangible things that I'm ready to do and I have more on the, on the plate that I can bring forward rather than just discuss philosophically. And you know, just one other thing 
This is all for community members, private sector, as well as there's a private, uh, there's a public side to it too. Thank you very much, Joe. Joe Norton. Again, you are listening to The Grand Debate on K103.7 FM. The four candidates running for the position of Grand Chief in this Saturday's election, which begins at 9 p.m. at Grunia Nuha School, ends at, six, at 9 a.m. and ends at 6 p.m. on Saturday. Represented here today, all of Gatnawage Media, including yours truly from K103.7 FM. I am Paul Grafe, the Eastern Door, Steve Bonspiel, Regan Jacobs from Mohawk TV, Gatnawage 411, from Yariwase and GatnawageNews.com, editor-publisher Greg Horn, and from Ganadagu TV, Channel coordinator Lauren McCumber. We are now going to go to Yuri Wase and Katnawagi News.com for our next question. Uh, and okay. Greg Horn. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think one of the questions uh, that that a lot of people that's on a lot of people's minds are in 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 relation to economic development is and uh, has to do with the tobacco industry. And I think Keith had touched on it a little bit. Uh, you know. Do you guys think that the tobacco industry is still a viable economic engine for the community? And if so, how do you see it moving forward uh, through legislation or through regulation? We're going to send that question over to Joe Norton as we're trying to keep it equal in terms of the order. Joe, you have 90 seconds. Um, I wish I had more time, but very quickly, I'm looking at it from a pushback. Pushback in terms of what the government of Canada has legislated into existence, and that is, I think it's Bill C-10. While we need to develop, as, uh, as we've seen already, the, um, the industry to solve itself is looking at self-regulating, but we also need to put in place a much broader, um, a much broader way of pushing back government by saying that it's illegal what they have done in terms of taking our product, tobacco, and it is our product. They never knew about it until they arrived here in North America way back when, or Turtle Island, and they took possession of it. They made it their product. They made it illegal for us to, uh, to utilize our own product, and they, um, they, they, they completely destroyed our use of it. And so now they have it in their possession, so now they're coming back at us and saying it's ours. So what we need to do is we need to fight back, not just Kahnawake, but we need to begin to work with all our brothers and sisters across uh, across North America, across Turtle Island to fight back and say that it's illegal what you have done. We're not illegal. Joe Norton, thank you very much. Next up on our uh, randomly selected but keeping it fair list, Keith Mayo, you have 90 seconds. Well, I guess <clears throat> what people call corporate memory, corporate knowledge, however you want to label it, Canada has came up with all kinds of uh, legislation. One, they say people can speak from the grave. Another was that we have trade east to west, but never north to south, because they would, they recognize that border, Canada. There is different UN policies, regulations that have come out recognizing the sovereignty of different Indian nations. Joe Biden joined uh, the Vice President of the United States, stated joined the Crimean, uh, uh, Crimean NATO conference. It is wrong for anyone, any single nation, to occupy another nation's territory. It is wrong. That was his statement to Russia and to NATO. But it's not wrong here in this corporate government called Canada. It's not wrong when an Indian is trying to make a living, but yet we don't have anyone recognized or even speaking up for our treaties. The bank council doesn't have treaties. We have to go back and put in our own traditional government and speak nation to nation, not administration or puppet regime. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Since we uh, I believe we're having some audio problems, Mike, if you can take the microphone that's in front of Keith for yourself, please. Uh, we are going to go to Mike DeLille now. And Mike, you now have 90 seconds. Thank you. I believe it's still an, a viable economic engine, and it hinges on one word, collaboration. I've, I've seen the lack of collaboration amongst council, the industry, individual groups representing the industry, various drafts, including 
drafts of a tobacco law from other communities, uh, other territories uh, within the Mohawk realm across this part of the country. And uh, until we can formally collaborate, agree on what the idea is, and come up with a solid, not only internal type of regulation, I understand and agree with what the group is doing today in terms of legislative process, but it needs to go beyond that for us to, I won't say stake the claim, but ensure that the community can prosper as a whole. Like I said earlier, individuals have become wealthy. It's created a lot of jobs and some form of independence within the community. But to have true independence, I think the law needs to be solid. The legislation needs to be based on collaborative effort amongst all of the people and players within the industry, as well as call us government, call us what you will, but the people who will be fighting it externally because it is about recognition and access to market. If you can't sell, you don't win. So to me, it's about collaboration, and until that happens, we're going to continue to struggle. But I, I believe it's still an, a viable economic engine. Mike Delel, thank you very much. Lloyd Phillips, you get the last word on this one. Well, certainly I believe the tobacco industry is a, is a viable industry. I mean, at 30 years plus in the community, generating you know, wealth, generating jobs is, uh, is proof into itself. It's certainly under attack by, by government, whether it be through uh, the latest bill or whether it be based on taxation and so on, uh, it, it has taken its toll and, and it, has, it has caused many problems. Uh, that's where I think we're on the right track, uh, working with the industry uh, to develop uh, a law that would, uh, would govern and, and oversee uh, the tobacco industry in the community as, as a step one on how it's going to operate internally. And then after that, like, step two would have to be a political pushback. We have to have the politicians uh, in the community working collaboratively to, to push back government, take a very strong position uh, against government, uh, and, and enforcing our law, enforcing our jurisdiction, using whatever means we at our disposal in terms of Aboriginal rights, treaty rights, and uh, to ensure that uh, it's protected. And also explore legal options. You know, this is a, a Canadian law that's out there that's, that's, that's challenging our jurisdiction. We should also consider looking at other legal options to, to go after them and play with them on their own court. Thank you very much, Lloyd Phillips. You're listening to The Grand Debate on K103.7 FM, The Eastern Door, Yariwaseganawagenews.com, Mohawk TV, Ganawage411.com, and Ganadago TV. Uh, joined by all of the journalists in Ganawage, we're asking the questions this evening. Uh, right now, it is just a question and answer period. We will get to debating a little bit later on. And uh, now I'd like to turn over the floor to uh, Steve Bonspiel from The Eastern Door. Steve? Thanks, Paul. Uh, the question is for Joe Norton. Joe, um, some people in the community have questioned, you know, why after all this time that you uh, chose to run this time around, um, and they have mentioned that, um, you know, it might, might have something to do with personal finances. We, we've all heard it as journalists, and uh, we wanted to ask you today, how do you answer that? Well, um, first of all, uh, that's, that's a personal issue, what my financial situation is like, and it's not really anybody's business. Uh, secondly... I left office 11 years ago, and I felt quite comfortable and confident that um, what, was, uh, what, what had happened the previous 26 years uh, was, uh, was solidly in place, and I felt good about it. And after more than a quarter of a century of being involved in the leadership in this community, I felt it was time to take a break and to leave. I was never under the impression that I would return. But since that time, the last 11 years, I've seen the deterioration of, um, of, our, uh, of what, what had been put in place, what we had strived so hard to do. And, you know, you just have to look at the, the recent uh, release in, in, in March of the uh, financial situation of Ganawage, the press release that was sent out by, by the MCK. And you look at that and you see that, you know, we are in dire straits in terms of the financing, uh, and there's a need to uh, to do something there in terms of uh, what was in the kitty and what was coming, what was appropriated funds coming from the government of Canada. So we need to build that back up, and I bring that kind of uh, background, that kind of uh, knowledge, having been out in the business world for the last 11 years and being able to bring forth projects, as I mentioned earlier on. 
Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Mike, I, I think it now it would be appropriate for you to respond if you could take the other microphone and, and respond to uh, what Joe just put out there as, as you have been the Grand Chief sitting for the last while. And the, these seem to be charges laid right, right at uh, your doorstep. You have a minute to respond. Thank you. Well, I don't believe we've deteriorated. I believe we've progressed in some areas of jurisdiction. Um, financially speaking, our administrative, our administration, uh, finance department is, I, I would say, beyond reproach. We receive a uh, clean bill of health every year. We knew full well for the last, I will say, more than 11 years that monies that would be coming in by provincial and or federal government, and the majority being federal, would diminish over the course of time. This isn't your grandfather's progressive conservative government. This is a very blue government that has pushed hard on their assimilation plan. And own source revenue is something that's obviously needed. Canada's gauge is own source revenue capacity, which means taxation. We could have had an agreement way back in the early 2000s that would have done that. That council said no. And I believe we've progressed in other areas as well, but no, I, I don't think we've regressed and will continue to grow, even though minor financial detriments and, and, and issues come up from time to time. Mike Delille, thank you very much. Back to uh, the journalists in the other room, uh, Greg. Greg Horn. Um, you, you were just talking about uh, the, the need to generate own source revenue. How, as a community, do, do we do that? Uh, you know, if, 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 we're, if council's not looking to get involved in business or, or whatever, how, how does Ganawage generate its own revenue? Who are you addressing to, Greg? That, that, that's, uh, I guess, uh, Mike had just mentioned that, but I'd like to hear from, from everybody, really. Okay, so Lloyd, let's let's start with you on that question, if uh, if you will. You have sixty seconds. Okay, the very quickly, we have infrastructure all around us. Highway one thirty eight, one thirty two, two hundred seven. We have seaway. We have uh, we have the uh, the hydro lines. Uh, we finally got Quebec back to the table to re renegotiate uh, an agreement going back to nineteen ninety nine on on user fees, which I strongly supported uh, at the time, and uh, we're looking to increase that revenue substantially over the next, uh, next uh, few months to, to a year. As well as Hydro-Quebec, we have uh, them at the table as well. I think it's time that they, they pay more than their fair share for the use uh, of our land and the way they impose themselves on our community. Right now, as we speak, there's also a, a bunch of uh, uh, taxes that are being paid by non-native people uh, on the territory in terms of gasoline. And that money goes into Quebec's pocket. And they're getting rich off of you know, our business people. Th those dollars must come back to our community. Right there, we're looking at millions of dollars that, that we could use directly for, for the community. And, and it comes out of the pockets of Quebec and nobody else. Thank you, Lloyd. Keith, if you'll uh, grab your microphone and a chance for you to uh, answer here. One minute. Well, I believe that there's an irregularity taking place here. You asked uh, a question by S Steve Bonspiel towards Joe and finances, only Joe and Mike get to respond to that particular question. So there's an irregularity in here Keith, not allowing us uh, allow to address that issue uh, from the other two. When we open it up, we will do that. We are trying to balance the questions as much as possible. That question began with a personal question about Joe's finances. We will get around to everyone. We are trying to keep it as equal as possible. Thank you. Would you like to address this issue now? Yes, I would. There's many ways that Gunnawaga can make money. Taxation ain't one of them. Taxation is coming in the back door towards businesses, as we seen one that shut down on the highway here not too long ago, and as we see another business is going to be taxed, and everybody in Gunnawaga is going to feel that. And we talk about getting partnership and so on, business going here in Gunawage, we can't even see the people that are in front of us. Back in the day, the bank council had, I guess, a stipulation. If they're going to go into business with anyone from the outside, the outside would have 48% and Gunawage would have 52%. That didn't happen with MIT. So with any financial irregularities that have occurred, 
Joe shouldn't be worrying about his financial disposition with all those millions that were out there. Thank you, Keith. Keith Mayo. Mike DeLille, if you'll grab Keith's microphone. Just because of an audio problem that we're experiencing at K103. Mike, you have one minute. I think the question was about the future of economic development in the community and business development from a political perspective as well as from, I guess, our Economic Development Commission. Uh, I, I believe that although there's been attempts, th there's a lack of, I won't call it true collaboration because the attempts have been, I think, sincere, but there, there needs to be a restructuring of how government interacts with economic development in and around the community of Ganawage. Uh, we amended the law way back when, removing the Grand Chief as the chairperson, because um, I felt and, and the council felt that it was too close, but now I believe that we need at least the economic development portfolio chief. We have our executive financial officer as an ex officio sitting with the board, and I say with the board, not at the board, but there needs to be real interaction. I, I've looked at models, specifically one in Manitoba that works and I hope to do that in terms of some of the changes that can happen within the law hopefully with community support because community drives it in the future. Mike Talel, thank you very much. Uh, we'll throw it back over to the uh, journalists in, in our second studio. Regan Jacobs, I believe. Okay. So oh, I'm sorry. I, I missed. Joe Norton did not get his opportunity. <laughs> Joe, thank you. My apologies. Thank you. Um, some of the uh, some of the uh, candidates touched on it, but we need to expand on it more. Um, I have said very clearly in the community that what we need is a um, is again pushback against all the things that have been brought here, and I'm going to say I'm going to say it illegally: the seaway, the bridges, the highways, uh, Bell Telephone, and all those all those uh, Hydro Quebec, all those different entities that are here now that in one way or another either purchased land or got a, a license or something or a permit to do it, well, we've got to pass our own Rights of Way Act here and abolish all of those things that are here and start over again, bring them to the table at an equal footing. Because what you've got is bits and pieces of negotiations going on all over the map, and they ain't working. So you've got to do something to turn this around. And that's, that's the way I would reapproach this. Joe Norton, thank you very much. Regan Jacobs. Yes, I have a question for Keith. Um, you know, Keith, considering that the membership issue in Gahnawage is really controversial at this point, there's been a lot of talk via social media about your current relationship with a non-native uh, woman. Um, would you say that this is accurate, and do you feel that it is a reflection of your values regarding the membership law here in Gahnawage? Well, as I stated earlier, the membership law, as far as any law is concerned, if you're getting rid of the meat and bones, doesn't exist. As for the woman I love, she is Algonquin Mi'kmaq. No one ever came to ask her, myself, but yet the bullets are flying and the big mouths are out there. And it's good that you put that out here. I don't mind. I'm not ashamed of anything. But the ones that have to be ashamed are the ones that are hiding behind their doors or the cloak of darkness, throwing rocks through windows and so on. These are the people that are dangerous. And that's why I said, if they come around me, that's up to them. Well, what, what do you mean by that? Well, that's up to them. Somebody wants to try to break my windows or hurt, damage my property, believe me, what goes around comes around. Fair enough. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Right now what we'll do since we've been here for exactly an hour is we're going to take a short break for everybody to catch their breath, and we'll be back with the grand debate. You're listening to it on K103.7 FM, along with all of the Gatnawagi media tonight. We'll be back. You're listening to The Grand Debate on K103.7 FM. And eat Milwaukee.
Grand Debate, brought to you in part by K103.7 FM, The Eastern Door, Ganawage 411, Yoriwaze, and Ganadagu Television. Here's your moderator, K103 News Director, Paul Grave. Welcome back to the second half of the Grand Debate here on K103.7 FM, The Eastern Door, Mohawk TV, Yoriwaze, Ganadagu TV. Uh, we are through one hour of the two hours. We will be ending at 8 p.m. tonight. Uh, the questions are continuing to go around from our panel of journalists. Steve Bonspiel from the Eastern Door. You're up next. I had a question for all the candidates. Uh, if elected, um, going to get business. You know, there's a lot of talk about non-native uh, business owners here and uh, going to get uh, businessmen trying to get ahead. How do you s- propose to support going to get business? All right. Since last time... Lloyd Phillips went last. Lloyd, you're first this time. Well, the, you said non-native businesses? Well, S- support local businesses because I, I, I cited the fact that there are non-native uh, business owners that are here, but, um, you know, sometimes maybe it, it, it appears that, non- that local businesses are not as supported by the council or, uh, you know, in different endeavors. So uh, just how do you propose to support local businesses uh, so they can get ahead? Well, I think, like I mentioned earlier, we have to really sit down and, and work directly with the business people in, in our community. I do feel there is a, a gap between MCK uh, and the business community. They feel left. They feel left out. They don't feel supported, and uh, that's why I would certainly support the fact of having uh, an engagement with them to an economic summit, where we'll have the opportunity to have those ideas uh, here directly from the business people. Uh, with the politicians in the room and, and see what they need and what they require from us and, and, and vice versa. So it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street, 
but uh, because I certainly believe if uh, if community business succeeds and then the whole community will succeed. Lloyd, thank you very much. Lloyd Phillips, Mike Delel, you now have 90 seconds. I think the best way to help and or promote Gunawagi business is to ensure that they hire local therefore providing true economy to Gunawage. We're, we've launched various initiatives, uh, but I still believe it's about education. Uh, we have many people in the community, 33% of our youth between the ages of 18 and 29 don't have a job, aren't in formal training, and don't have a formal education. If we can boost those numbers and make them qualified to be hired by our local people, because there's a lot of non-natives, obviously, that work for local people, contractors, businesses, and so on, I think that's the best way to support local business. Mohawk Council of Gunawagi does support local economy, local business, to a larger degree, to the best we can, I think, at this point. But I think hiring local, staying in Gunawage, uh, will help <laughs> our economy grow. Mike Delel, thank you very much. Now over to Keith Mayo. Well, in the just the recent past, there was a communication put out by the bank council that says, if I remember correctly, they can only offer moral support for the tobacco trade. So I take it that what is moral support oh yeah i support you don't mean nothing and we all see the evidence of it so that's one item another item is do we support local businesses i say no there's one business as i stated earlier that shut down for tax reasons is what the rumor is and another business just down from rabaska is one of the biggest ones in the area is possibly looking at the same situation, same scenario. The language has to change. Federal law, so-called Indian Act, says anything delivered to an Indian reservation is free from tax, anything. Well, the bank council on its self-government agreements changed that language and it turned it over to the individual being tax-free. It took away from any legitimacy that we have to defend that right. If we want to really defend that right, everybody that's living in Gunawage in the scenery start putting Native people to work out there Thank now. You. Thank you, Keith. Your time is up. Joe Norton, you now have 90 seconds. Thank you. I belong to an organization called the National Indigenous Council of Elders. That's made up, uh, Andrew Lula and I are part of that organization. Andrew Little Sr., and uh, they're, they are professional people, retired, uh, retired uh, uh, chiefs and, uh, and heads of, uh, of various uh, companies and um, lawyers, and these are all indigenous people from across Canada. And we recently held a, we recently held a meeting here in Ganawaga. Andrew and I organized it, and we had a number of different uh, business people come to that meeting where we sat and we talked and the question was asked about what what do you expect of the of the Mohawk Council of Ganawage to uh, to assist in making this a better environment for business and, and helping their business so that they in turn can help others and there was quite a wide variety of responses but they basically said that you know they need more response from the council they need more opportunities in terms of what their particular businesses are and the training aspects of it too, to bring individuals, young individuals, encourage them to get into, into uh, the training aspects and become a part of uh, the growing business, but also leave it open for individuals to start up their own businesses too. Joe Norton, thank you very much. Now we'll uh, bring it over to Ganadagu TV and Lauren McCumber. Lauren? Uh, this question is directed towards Lloyd, but if any of the other chiefs want to step in, that's fine. Um, Lloyd, how would you go about seeking the opinions of community members on the issue of membership and non-native residency? You mentioned that it was important to do that, but I wanted to know, how would you do it? Okay, well, the, one of the key elements that we have to do is create that safe environment for people to have the um, 
uh, the willingness to open uh, speak openly uh, to to council members or speak openly uh, amongst uh, their peers that they feel safe with there's some examples out there which we recently uh, did in terms of senior uh, negotiations allowing individuals to create their own groups whether it be at the home or whether they want to come to council with three or four people ten people whoever they, they want to have a discussion with and, and have the, the chiefs available for them to to, to listen uh, in a non-judgmental way to really hear and, and engage uh, their opinion and from there you know you, you formulate the proper report to say this is what people are saying thank you lloyd regan yeah i have a question for uh, all the candidates if they uh, Can want to uh, address that issue that, uh, that lloyd just uh, okay. uh yes katie you certainly may you have 90 seconds <laughs> all righty first and foremost what needs to be done is the people have to be engaged to gather knowledge right and proper to have a clear understanding as how we identified each other. I stated that earlier, but evidently it has fallen on deaf ears and we have to engage the community. There's a number of plans to be utilized. The main one is education. People have to clearly understand and where it comes from is from the Mohawk Nation. We brought in the Europeans here through ceremony. That ceremony was through treaty. That treaty has become watered on down, known as the Silver Covenant chain. That understanding on how we identify ourselves as citizenship, we are going by blue bloods. We have to straighten that out real quick because the outside is watching very attentively, watching us dog eat dog. The, the, the Indian crabs are eating one another. We have to stop that, and we have to stop that now. We don't have much time. Some of the greatest people that we have today, Ray Fadden, who is no longer with us, Rowdy Hoquats, Jerry Gamble, who was the founder and editor of the Aguasasna Notes. Thank All you. non-natives, but were thank, brought no, in. Keith, thank you very much. Your 90 seconds have expired. Joe Norton, you wanted to jump in yeah, on this Yeah, um, to the question that Lauren asked. Uh, why reinvent the wheel? In, um, in 2001, 2002, 2003, I think that was, the, that was the, the time period in which there were three women that went through the community and did the same thing. They did a complete community survey, and it took that long. It took uh, two, two and a half years, three years, and they consulted with just as many people as they could get, individuals, groups, families, and what have you. And they accumulated all that information, put it in a report. They dealt with the elders' council at that time, and it was just strictly on the issue of, uh, of membership. Out of that came a custom code that was developed that was presented to the council. Uh, once, uh, I'll put it this way, once I was out of there, that thing became very watered down and changed beyond uh, the, what I would consider to be the acceptable level. What remained intact was the fact that, you know, there's still non-natives are not allowed to, to reside in Ganawaga a certain, within a certain uh, time period. So basically that's been done. It's there. It's on the shelf. Let's take it down. Let's give it a relook and put it back out in the community and get, uh, get things going again. Joe, you mentioned uh, acceptable level. What's an acceptable level to you? Well, it was, it's not just an accept, acceptable level to me. It's an acceptable level to the, to the community. What is that? That's what it was. And, and what is that? Well, then you'd have to review the whole uh, membership issue. Oh, well, we're asking you now. Well, I can't review it here tonight. But what I can tell you is the work that was done by those, by those women was something that was, was, um, was brought forth. And this is, this again, I'm repeating myself, but it was accumulated by a lot of hard work, a lot of goodwill, and very openness uh, by community members. You know, and, and it was something that they said, this is what we can, uh, this is what we've gathered from the community. This is what the community wants. And it was done. Mike, okay, did you, Mike, I have, did, a, I have oh. a quick question for that. I know that, you know, you, you say, why reinvent the wheel? But, you know, over the last year, especially, people have been talking a lot about this membership issue and ensuring that the community still supports the same things that they did 10 to 15 years ago. Do they still support the marry out, get out rule? How do we know for sure? There's been a lot of talk about uh, supporting uh, or holding a referendum to gain a concrete answer. Where do you, do the candidates stand on this? 
All right, we will address uh, in order then again. Regan, you want that to everyone, I assume? Yeah, with Joe answering first. Okay. Yeah. You don't need a referendum. What you need to do is review what I already just said has happened. Put that back on the table, put it out there, and get people to uh, respond to it. And if it is the right thing to do, then they'll say, yes, this is what we need. This is what we're willing to do. With some modifications, because as you said, it's been, it's been 10 years, 11 years, 12 years since, since that happened. And, uh, but it is still there. Those, those women are still willing to go out and talk and meet with people. I spoke to them as recently as last week. And they have no problem with uh, revisiting all of this. So it's there. Joe, thank you. Mike? Mike DeLow? Well, going back a little bit um, to answer Lauren's question, uh, I believe education, again, is key to for younger people as well as maybe people who have forgotten uh, based on more recent incidents. The history of membership presidency within this community of Ganawage. We, we launched a plan last two weeks ago, sorry, and uh, we're sticking to that. We, we hope that it continues beyond uh, June 20th, hopefully, because we put time and effort into it to not only bring down temperatures in the community, but again, as has recently been said, you know, to see if the sentiment in the community remains the same. I believe it does, but until we engage in community conversation to ensure that that is the will of the people, I believe the plan is as solid as it's going to be. We already said maybe a little bit of uh, being overzealous in, in saying September for a referendum, but at the end of the day, maybe the community determines that. Uh, we'll see. But Community conversation is key to ensure that council, again, has the understanding of community, direction of community, and moving forward with this very contentious issue. Um, second question again, sorry, I was focused on the first one. I think you answered it also when oh. we talked about having a, a, re a referendum to, to be able to solidify if uh, that's where the community still stands on it. Oh, okay, thank you. And, thank and I just you. wanted to maybe clarify one thing, too. I understand what Joe is talking about in uh, the research that was done, the elders committee that was formed, and not the council of elders, but an actual elders committee in this community that stepped forward and said, this is what needed to be done. And the uh, community task force brought together the, the custom code and based on the will of the people, direction of the people, and brought it forward. But <clears throat> the law was passed in 2003. Joe was chief then. Uh, part of that decision, I think, whether it's watered down or not, was basically to ensure that the law could be upheld. And obviously we see that hasn't happened. It's not his fault. I'm just saying he was part of that decision when we did make that decision in 2003. Okay. Lloyd, uh, your turn to answer uh, the question. Well, I was going to address the same concern as well about the comment that Joe made regarding uh, the membership in 2003. He was the Grand Chief. But uh, that was you know, 15 years ago. We had the consultation with that, that, that was done uh, in the community. And is that still the, the general sentiment as it is, is today uh, like I said earlier I believe it is but if we're truly going to gauge the will of the people and we're going to stand up and have to stand in front of whether it be our own community first and foremost have to stand up in outside courts stand up wherever we have to stand up in the United Nations and say this is the will of our people I want to be sure that it truly is the will of our people we'll never get 100% that's for sure but we have to be able to stand, stand up strong and saying this is what our people want and our people want this law to stand, it will stand, we will defend it, we will do our best to enforce it. But it, it's, it's not an easy task, but it's something that, that has to be done. And one way of engaging that, and we talked about this extensively at, at Council, is at some point having a referendum on a certain element of residency, not membership, on residency only, to form the, the basis of, of, a, of, a, of a law moving forward. And with a strong basis, with, a, with the with true will of the people, I think it's uh, you're set in the right direction. Lloyd Phillips, thank you very much. Keith, I'm going to turn the microphone over to you, but uh, we're going to do two questions here real quickly. Everybody in the community wants to know what happened a week ago. You said you were going to be at the uh, candidates' night and did not show. You said even earlier that afternoon when you were here at K103 that you were going to be there. What happened? Why weren't you there? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. I should have addressed that right at the get-go, but I apologize. I had a very, uh, very personal situation that came up at the time, and it could not be overlooked. It demanded my 100% attention, and I would do the same for any other situation in regards to the way I was on council in the past years, 
I, Did you call ahead and tell Dwayne that, that you weren't going to be there, the electoral officer who had organized the candidates' night? Did you uh, let him know no, at the last minute? No, I did not. Okay. No. And I apologize for it. It was an oversight on my behalf. However, I make that apology. I'm here today. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not running away. I'm not going nowhere. And there's nothing that I'm scared of. All right, Keith, now to answer the question that's on the table. Uh, there has to be an education that has to take place. For far too long, we've been doing things the white way and not the right way. Right way is through knowledge, knowledge of who we are traditionally, historically, not the way that the Indian Act has dictated. If we go back a few years, 1907, uh, the Quebec City Bridge Massacre, Half the men in Gunawage were wiped out at that time. There's a lot of situations that occurred after that, okay? But people are people, and they have different scenarios in their lives. They're looking for someone. Now, how they go about that and how we legitimize is going back to our own traditional way, but that is based on education. People are not educated. They're doing it out of spite, out of hate, out of jealousy, uh, hatred, you name it. Those things have to stop. We have to do things in an open-minded way. And the only place that you can be doing that is under the Guyana de Goa, the great law of peace. That was the mandate of the declaration to return to traditional government in 2001. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Over to Greg Horn. Act Actually, I'm yeah, I, yeah, I'm still in it. Um, just, you know, there's been a lot of uh, mention this evening about the the will of the people and the return to traditional government, which seems to be a mandate that was given back in the 70s. Um, but just to go back quickly, earlier in the conversation, Mike, you had pointed out that the courier ships lies within the realm of the Confederacy. Do you candidates feel that the eight points of jurisdiction also lie within the Confederacy? Mike, you were addressed first. <laughs> we'll play musical microphones here for a moment. Mike DeLille, up Sorry. now. You have 90 <clears throat> seconds. Thank you. Um, it, it's been a point of contention. Uh, I've been part of a couple of meetings talking about that to traditional leadership, uh, with traditional leadership about that. And there's difference of opinion, obviously. Uh, we, point of contention. We're, we're trying to reach out singularly on residency membership to see what kind of dialogue we can have and hopefully resolve uh, over the course of a period of time. The initial meeting obviously hasn't happened. The letter just went out. The call just went out, I believe, yesterday to uh, leadership within the community. But I have concerns specifically to this issue as well on how it rolls out and is implemented in Ganawage. I've always said I'm selfish for Ganawage, um, understanding that the nation has a responsibility, Confederacy beyond that, but how does it roll out here in Ganawage? Uh, it's not 100 years ago, it's not 400 years ago, it's not 700 years ago. It's still based on survival, yes, and the will of the people obviously comes into play, but we've seen what some of our people have done in and around with this to this community about residency and membership, bringing people in. That's the problem at this point. So we're, we're trying to have that dialogue. Overall, I'll say for the eight points of jurisdiction, I respect the position. I would like to have, again, initial dialogue, restart, reboot, if you will, <laughs> and, and go from there on behalf of MCK. Mike Dillow, thank you very much. Next up, uh, Keith Mayo, you have 90 seconds. Historically, traditionally, yesteryear or even today or far into the future the confederacy is a dispute mechanism and people have to understand what that is again it has to be educationally dispersed to the people we had a discussions on the garner de Goa, the great law of peace over by the old radio station uh, under a big tent it was uh, videotaped the whole nine yards miraculously those tapes disappeared like gas in the wind. Well, here we are 14 years later after the, the mandate to return, uh, the declaration to return to traditional government. Nothing has been done. 
since 2007. So if the Mohawk Nation is going to be there, this community as being part of the Mohawk Nation has to learn its role, it has to be educated, it has to know how we identify one another. But we are not doing that. We're busy attacking one another. That has to stop. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Uh, next up, Lloyd Phillips. Okay, well, the eight points of jurisdiction, uh, I can't recall all of them off the top of my head, but I know there, were, there was a few of them that, you know, uh, the council had agreed. It is not our role to, to take on certain responsibilities, that it is the role of, of the, uh, the Mohawk Nation and the Confederacy. And uh, I think some of the other ones that are, are outstanding, it's, uh, I think a lot of it has to do with education on both sides. Uh, maybe people have to sit down and have that open dialogue to really explain what MCK is doing or not doing for that matter. Uh, they talk about negotiations with government on certain elements and, and so on. Uh, maybe if you have a better understanding of why we're doing certain things uh, and how we're going about it and what's our role and what's our goal, I think there'll be a much uh, better understanding. And, and on the flip side as well, some of the big questions that are asked uh, you know, uh, to, um, to the traditional side on about how certain things get done, what are, are, are your positions on certain, certain topics and why. If we have that dialogue and there are people willing on both sides and I'm one of them and I, I know it can be done, if we put the energy behind it, as much as we put energy dealing with outside governments, we put internally, you know, we, we, could, uh, we could tackle that and that will be a true expression of the will of the people and uh, really be able to assert our jurisdiction. Lloyd Phillips, thank you very much. Joe Norton. Yes, uh, this is the recent... Um I guess document that came out that said her letter came out eight points of jurisdiction that's not the first time over 20 years ago that same type of uh, uh, position came out and said very clearly to uh, what was then the forerunner to the Iroquois caucus when we were meeting on a regular basis I was also part of the uh, we went from community to community to community right down into the US and part of the traditional uh, elected council uh, joint, um, I guess a joint kind of uh, of opportunity that was formed to try and get the communities together on a working relationship. So I've I've been in, I was involved and I'm still involved to this very day talking about that possibility. And yes, the eight points, they are uh, points and issues that I can that I can live with. I don't have a problem with that. The only thing is the the concern I have is how does that function between the two parties? You got this. We'll focus more in Ganawage, the elected council here and the traditional council here. How do they work together? How do they make sure that we're not encroaching on those eight points? And and in turn, how do we assist in um, in uh, moving towards a traditional type of government? taking its rightful place here in Ganawaga. Joe Norton, thank you very much. You're listening to The Grand Debate live on K103.7 FM on our panel of journalists, The Eastern Door, Steve Bonspiel from Walk TV, Ganawage411.com, Executive Producer Regan Jacobs from Uda USA and GanawageNews.com, Editor-Publisher Greg Horn from Ganado Go TV, Channel Coordinator Lauren McCumber. I'm Paul Greif, the News Director at K103.7 FM with our four Grand Chief Candidates in no particular order, Lloyd Phillips, Joe Norton, Keith Mayo, and Mike DeLille. We're going to throw it over to Greg Horn now for a question for the panel. Uh, you know, th and this is a general question to everybody. Um, we're, a lot of people, and, and tonight we've, we've heard a lot about education and, and educating our youth and educating our people. Um, with, you know, a uh, very public battle against the federal government uh, with the First Nations Control over First Nations Education Act and the need for additional funding. How do we get the necessary resources to both have teachers in our community to be able to properly teach our teachers and to teach our community members uh, to be uh, to be able to get the jobs and and to be you know you know have positive impacts on the community? What we're going to do now is we're going to shorten the time for the answers to 60 seconds per candidate because we are running short on time and there are questions to get to from some callers that have uh, sent us questions as well. Keith Mayo, you have 60 seconds. It is important for the people know the difference between a trustee and fiduciary responsibility and a beneficiary. 
The government of Canada has been conspiring through a mechanism called the Indian Act to do away with our people and that financial responsibility. And the present bank council systems right across Canada have been accommodating that. What we need to do, what we should have done since 2001, is put back our traditional representatives. And then we can be dealing with the monies that are owed to us through treaty, not the way Canada has been lying to their people by saying it's coming out of the taxpayers' pockets, which is an outright lie. That's coming from the treaty monies that are owed to us. We have to tap into that money instead of just going by a spitting of the interest that is owed to us. Thank you, Keith. Joe Norton. Yes, I guess more on a uh, practical side. Um, I mentioned earlier on about the, um, about the driver, the um, driving academy uh, for long distance drivers being established here, having it as a, um, as a training center to teach and educate. Well, uh, one, of, uh, one of the things that I did not mention was that there, there, uh, there could be a willingness to put this under education, the education of Ganawage, come under their authority and revenues derived from that would go towards the education system to help uh, to help uh, where it's required, where it's needed. Not to go to the bank council, not to go to in, in some other fund, but for the education department. So that's a suggestion that I have uh, on a short term to help alleviate the financial situation. Joe Norton, thank you very much. Mike DeLell. Twofold. Um, I, I think, number one, community needs to support economic ventures, uh, whether they be in the community or outside of the community, i.e. Ganawagi Sustainable Energies, very viable revenue generation models that can be used to fund education. I think we need to stop looking externally and build internally as well. And there are other projects that we could talk about. So that's number one. Uh, I, I think it's crucial that communities support economic ventures. The second point is that the, the, the ventures that are here, uh, again, hire our people. And why can't the education system you know, work in conjunction with private entrepreneurs? I think we've built a better model than has been there in the, before, and the capacity is there uh, to work in unison to be able to ensure we build a true economy here in Ganawaga. Mike DeLille, thank you very much. Now, we do have questions that have been coming in from the public, being phoned in. Uh, Lloyd, I'm sorry, you have 60 seconds. Lloyd Phillips, my mistake. Okay, well, I think the question is about, about financing uh, regarding the education. And uh, first of all, we have to make sure we have a very strong stance internally, uh, standing by our, our principles of keeping and maintaining control of our education systems in, in, in the community. I think it's something very proud that, that we have. And also the, the recent assault that the federal government had on, on our uh, education is, uh, I'm proud to say that Ganawage, and starting with a meeting in, in Odenak, was among the first to be opposed to it. And we gathered community support and national and regional support, and we managed to, to, to stop that bill from actually passing. And also, we have to look internally the funding issues and look at standards of education and ask ourselves some, some tough questions like why are half the students not going to Ganawage schools? Do we have to look at modifying our internal systems to better accommodate the needs of everybody and then maybe financing wouldn't would be such a, a problem if all our local students stayed locally? Okay, thank you, Lloyd Phillips. Now we're going to take a question that was uh, phoned into us. We've gotten a few of those and we're screening through them. Uh, this is going to go to the entire panel here. In regards to membership and proposed evictions, how do you propose to protect the rights of Mohawk children of mixed marriages who are removed from the community as a secondary effect to their parents being removed from the community if, if and when that should happen? Uh, so we will go in order. Uh, Lloyd, you're up. Well, that's that's always been the question, right? And it's been very tough because uh, if you marry, you know, the whole marry out, get out rule that's out there. If the if the child leaves the the territory and then they 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 don't have the opportunity to to be part of of the community, so we have to ensure. And one thing is is education system. 
I think it's something that has to have that dialogue. If you have a, have a child of, of a mixed relationship, they should have the opportunity to go to school in the community, to grow up here as, as, as much as possible and integrate with the students. Sure, they may have to go, you no know, live uh, in, in Shadagi or wherever for, you know, uh, as long as they're, they're in this, in this uh, the law is don't change. But we have to afford them as much opportunity to be part of this community as possible in an education system and going to school here and, and being amongst your people is, is, is key. Lloyd Phillips, thank you very much. Uh, Mike DeLille, you're next up on the list. I agree. We have to stop following Indian Act mentality and old age mentality in terms of <laughs> alienating everyone, including these children. Um, that law needs to change. It's archaic. Our internal policies need to be able to be more accommodating. Also, though, in the same breath, it pushes that uh, financial button to the edge as well, saying, well, we have a hard time now coping if we're going to add then it's going to be a greater burden. But, but I think then the responsibility will fall back to council, hopefully in co cooperation and collaboration with the education center. And like I said, the, the, I think the trust has been built over the past two and a half years, getting off to a rocky start at the beginning of this term. But to me, it's, it's still the foundation to, to be able to dialogue with them to ensure that they can go to school here, be integrated into the community, visit it. I'm thinking more with their grandparents, aunts, uncles, and their other extended family. They live here. Mike, thank you very much. Keith, you have one minute. Yeah, they can live here, but uh, their mother and father, you can hit the road. So it boils on down to identifying who we are. Again, it goes right back to traditional government. Under the Goa, the great love, peace. And if people can't understand how we have to legitimize every action that we do, then we might as well just go home and, uh, you know, kick ourselves in the butt. We're done. Are you done? I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Joe Norton. Well, everybody said just about what I what I would say uh, in terms of and the in terms of having the ability of um, of the children of mixed marriages to continue to uh, be a part of Ganawagi in one way or another. I have family members who are in the same category. Um, it's not always an easy thing to deal with, but I mean, there's we've drawn the line in the sand way back in 1981. People have continued to maintain that, that position as much as they can. The opportunity for uh, those children of mixed marriages to, uh, to return and upon their own uh, when they reach the age of 18 uh, to reinstate, you know, as long as they remarry back in the community is there. It's, it's something that, um, unfortunately for some will affect them. And for others, I guess they'll be, they'll feel that they're justified in, in, um, in putting in place such a, uh, such a regulation or a law. Joe Norton, thank you very much. You're listening to The Grand Debate Live on K103.7 FM with the four candidates for Grand Chief, Mike DeLille, Keith Mayo, Joe Norton, and Lloyd Phillips. I'm Paul Grafe, along with all of the Katnawagi media. Uh, let's get to uh, Greg Horn. I believe you have a, a question now. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, Keith, you were just talking about uh, traditional government and, and the return to traditional government. But do you have a roadmap on how we can get from where we are as a community being governed by the MCK to traditional government under the Guyana Goa? Well, I don't believe we're governed by the MCK. They are administering to the fiduciary responsibility as trustees to the beneficiary who is us. So when it comes right on down to it, if it was a government, then why is that particular so-called government duplicating all these services? You got two, you got a cultural center right behind my back here. You got another cultural center over there. Where the hay in any society do you have two cultural centers in the same little footprint? So with all these things that are going on, the roadmap is already there. We set it in stone. But the band council itself doesn't want to go that route. You hear younger people on the radio, one that was on here not too long ago, stating that we need a constitution. The band council don't have a constitution. That's 100% right. We have what we need to solidify our younger people, f future generations, for all time to come, not seven generations. Thank, thank you, Keith. 
uh, I, I have a quick follow to that one. Why are you running? You don't believe in the I system. Can. The same reason why I ran the last time is to get us out of that. If I'm in a car with a bunch of drunks and I'm sitting in the back seat and I see them heading for a brick wall, I'm going to suffer the same fate. So I have to make my effort to prevent us from hitting that brick wall, no matter how much I may dislike, hate, or otherwise. Thank you, Keith. Lauren McCumber, you have a question. I do. Um, let's say if a non-resident, uh, sorry, non-native residency law is in fact the will of the people, if the people decide uh, to vote for it, how would it look? How would you enforce it? That's for all of you. Okay, that's for everybody. Uh, Joe Norton, you're first on the list. Well, I would go far as far as to say that there is something in place now that says that non-native people cannot live in Ganawage. We can't turn back time. We can't turn back history. Pre-1981, that's the way it was, and that's the way it is now. I think what happens is now you need to codify it in writing, and there was a, there was a beginning for that, uh, predated to 1981, and moving forward, it becomes clearer and clearer. I mean, the, uh, it, 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 there, there is a start date in 1981, as I mentioned, and it goes on right up until now. If you're just looking at purely uh, residency, then it's there. You don't need to rewrite that in any way, shape, or form. Joe, thank you very much. Uh, second on the list, uh, Lloyd. Okay, it's a matter of enforcement. It obviously has, has been the key uh, problem since uh, since day one, since 1981, uh, really, and we're still living it to this day. Uh, part of the answer is um, having our own justice system in place. We can hear all our laws. At least there is proper uh, recourse for individuals if they don't agree with the law or if they're charged or or uh, Im impacted by it they have a system of of um, of courts and and judges to hear the, their their uh, their concerns and and make a ruling on it uh, that that's a, a very key element but hopefully we shouldn't have to get that far because if it's truly the will of the people and then the, the people who are impacted by it you no know, we're hoping that it's a matter of respect. They understand that this is the will of the people, that the non-native is not uh, eligible to live here, and, and they decide to uh, conduct themselves accordingly. Lloyd, well, thank you very much. Keith? Well, we've seen spokespersons from some of the longhouses here in Gunawage, some of them uh, highly questionable background when it comes to, as what the bank council goes by, blood, blood quantum. And all of a sudden, they drop out of sight as soon as this whole fiasco started. So what I look at is, again, education. People have to understand exactly what, when you put your left foot forward, your right foot isn't far behind. So you have to gain responsibility through knowledge. Moreover, there has to be an element that recognizes from that band council system recognizes traditional ways of how we bring people in. Is there going to be a marriage between those two items? No. There has to be only one understanding. And this is what all Gunawaga has to come to, one understanding. Now, is it going to be a plebiscite? Is it going to be a referendum? Yes, it's going to have to be. That's the only way that you're going to get everybody to recognize it, or else we're going to be facing the same garb that we're facing now. We all have egg on our face. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Finally, Mike DeLille. Respectfully, I don't know. Because if it goes through legislative coordinating commission, community and decision making process, I don't know what it would look like. Uh, enforcement's the issue still today. Uh, if we're talking about a residency law allowing people of non-native descent to reside within the community, it may become a different level of enforcement. but. I honestly can't answer because I don't know what it would look like. Community members have asked for this to be put into the legislative hopper. It hasn't been addressed yet because the hopper is full. Maybe the next term it will, but uh, I, I really can't answer on what it looks like because I have no idea what it would look like. 
Mike Dillow, thank you very much. Uh, back to our uh, panel of journalists. Yes, I'm going to ask a question about the uh, Mohawk Council's recent decision to get into the e-gaming business. Now, there's been a lot of reaction out in Kahnawake to this decision. Um, you know, even though the people voted against a land-based casino a number of times, um, do you guys feel that this is just a way of getting around or, you know, getting circumventing the issue and, and getting into e-gaming? W who would you like to start with? Um, it, I mean, I'm just random and throwing it out there. Okay, so then let's go in the order. More, more Mike DeLille, since he is the current Grand Chief. Mike? No, the answer is not to circumvent referendum because all three, the issue and the question was very specific about building a land-based casino for the benefit of Ganawage. This isn't it. This is, or, or a precursor to it. Um, we had the referendum lastly in 2012. This isn't to get around, step around, or backdoor any of those issues back into community purview. It's about economic development and revenue generation. We've been criticized in the past, uh, and some of that criticism came out tonight in terms of MIT, whether you call it Continent 8, and whatever else has been built to generate revenue for community uh, on, on the backs of our jurisdiction, admittedly so. Um, that still isn't recognized, unfortunately, in North America, but is worldwide um, other than here. This is the attempt to get into the market, become a player within that market, and remain lucrative because the company is lucrative. I've heard all types of rumor, innuendo, and uh, slander, I'll call it, even uh, on social media. This is to generate revenue for community, by community, and only for community, not individuals. Thank you, Mike Talel. Keith Mayo, you're up next. Well, uh, I believe zero tolerance was the order of the day. But band council picks and choose what part of zero that it's going to go with, enforce, or follow. Whether it be membership, this ship, or sunken ship, it all decides on its own which ones to be in or what not to be in. Total disregard of the people, the will of the people, and that's what this system is. And this is the system we have to change. Keith Mayo, thank you very much. Lloyd Phillips. Okay, well, I don't think it's a, a way to circumvent the referendum. I have to agree with, I have to agree with that point. Uh, no, I'm not opposed to assertion of jurisdiction. I'm certainly not opposed to revenue generation and job creation. I mean, it's some of the, the three principles I think that uh, I'm running my campaign on, and I think most people in the community support that. But uh, as the media already knows, uh, I did not support that decision. Uh, I had my, my reasons behind it. And uh, it's, it's uh, something that I feel that uh, if I put it on a personal level, if it was me as an individual, uh, I couldn't agree to um, the understanding that was reached. And uh, so I can't commit the community to, to into that. Lloyd, thank you very much. Joe Norton. Um, I guess as everyone will recall, I was a member of the Mohawk Council of Ganawage, the Grand Chief, when the... Um, when the uh, referendum, first referendum on, on, uh, on la um, land-based casinos was introduced, the second time also. And then eventually we discussed the issue of uh, online gaming. And there was discussion in the community and it was made very clear, abundantly clear, that this was not a part of uh, online uh, land-based casino and that this was something else that could be, that could be very, uh, helpful to us and it's proven and has been. Now, having said that, I have no problem with going into uh, a business such as, uh, such as the MCK has, has initiated. But the only thing is, and I say the biggest thing is that there should have been discussion with this community about that. How much money was gonna go in? What would be the outcome? Instead of getting it at a time, uh, you know, on uh, a, a news flash, if you will, and just prior to uh, uh, an election. So to me, it's part of an election ploy. Thank you very much, uh, Joe Norton. Gentlemen, we have time for one last question before we're going to give you an opportunity for closing statements. You're listening to The Grand Debate with the four candidates for Grand Chief, Mike DeLille, Keith Mayo, Joe Norton, and Lloyd Phillips. I'm Paul Gray from K103, where you're listening live, along with all of the various Gaknawage media. And uh, Regan, I believe you have the final question. 
Yes, I'm uh, wanting to, we, you know, we've all discussed this and we're looking at what makes a good Grand Chief in your opinion. Obviously, this is a very public position and your lives are put out uh, to the public to be debated and, and also reviewed. Do you feel that personal values is a reflection of holding office and uh, where do you draw the line? What, what makes a good Grand Chief? Okay, we'll go to Keith first. Uh, on this one. Keith, you have one minute. Well, I guess it boils down to the community has to come up with the, the criteria for that. I've seen in the past where grand chiefs do what they want for their own personal benefit and gain and manipulate council, as we've seen just recently, how two council members were reprimanded. You know, why go and vote for anyone if the council is going to put something in place where they can pick and choose who's going to be on council. So these are your representatives. You have to decide and decide you will. When, when you're going to be doing that, you're going to find out who you have to ask yourself that question. Are they being honest? Or is it just for a personal benefit and gain as we've seen? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mike DeLille. <laughs> What makes a good grand chief, I believe, was the question. Correct, Regan? Yep. I think in a word, I believe in a word, determination. This community, as I stated earlier, is very demanding, rightly so. Mohawks of Ganawagi has always, have always been a proud people and deserve the best. If the, if the chief and whatever you want to call it, chairperson, leadership position, you know, steering the ship, doesn't have the determination to do the job successfully, then, then I think the ship goes down. Uh, it, it's been led in, in a proper way, and I personally take offense to saying, you know, Keith has witnessed personal gains and, and steering the ship in the wrong direction. I've never done that. Um, you can snicker all you want. We're trying to be respectful here, but um, I do the best for the community. And again, I think integrity and all the other principled values that we help hold dear but to me, it's determination. If you're not determined to do this job, you're going to fail. Mike DeLille, thank you very much. Joe Norton. Yes, um, if uh, track record means anything, my past experiences as, uh, as the Grand Chief of Ganawaga for uh, over a quarter of a century uh, speaks for itself in terms of all the things that happened, all the things that we were able to accomplish. And I just say, not just me, but working with people, being able to, to influence and convince and to uh, motivate. Uh, that's, one of, that's one of my greatest strengths is to motivate people uh, to move in a certain direction and get things done. And that's what I bring back to the table, combined with my experience now in the business world and with all the contacts and the connections that are out there in terms of economic development, defending our jurisdiction, our political will internally, working together, doing the things I need to get done. I have those qualities. Joe Norton, thank you very much. Lloyd Phillips. No, is it about personal values? It's a 100% about personal values. If you're going to be in a leadership position in this community, you know, you got to have the integrity. you got to have the honesty. You have to have the trust of the people. That's the support of the people. It's almost a sacred trust when they decide to support you, put X by your name. They're, they're instilling trust on, in you. And it's your, it's your job to maintain that trust and be, be open and honest. Key values of family. Family is extremely important to me. I'm very close to my family, extended family. I'm very proud of that. Uh, being respectful is key. There's many times, you know, you feel in your heart you want to say something harsh to somebody. Because the words are being thrown at you, you feel very easy to want to throw back those words. But you try your best to be respectful because you are the leader. You're held to a higher standard. I also take somebody who's a team builder. I'm a team builder, takes a team player, and I'm a team player. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, what we'll do now, since it is 7.54, we'll give everybody 90 seconds to wrap up and say what they have to say and why they're running for Grand Chief and why people should vote for them on Saturday. You're listening to The Grand Debate. What we'll do is we'll go back to the original order that was chosen when you walked into the building this evening just before 6 o'clock for this debate. Uh, and go with that order. Joe Norton, you chose first. You are up first. Well, I've said about all I can say in terms of uh, 
what my uh, what my campaign is, what my platform is, but it's more than just that. It's not winning an election. It's it's getting into a position to be able to redirect issues, to review all the things that have happened over the last 10 years, 11 years, and to be able to uh, redefine them and to put them in a in in a proper fashion. Because I know from past experiences, and I know what I've seen. I see uh, I see the issues of jurisdiction. I see the issues of economy. I see them uh, not uh, not being where they should be at. I'm a person who's not satisfied with the status quo. I believe that you've always got to raise the bar. You've always got to go to the next level. And I didn't see that happen in, in the last 10 years or so. I haven't seen that at all. What I've seen is basically standing still and flattening out, flatlining, as is, I guess as some people would call it. Joe Norton, thank you very much. Keith Mayo, you have 90 seconds. When an, an individual is informed, educated, or even pays attention <coughs> to the daily happenings, then they become a little bit more sensitive to that which is taking place around them. The responsibility of choosing is not because of a relative, a friend, or because uh, someone is popular. No. You have to look at that individual's commitment, their own responsibilities and when it comes right down to it it'd be close to impossible to choosing an X next to anybody's name here and now and that's the truth next thank you Keith Mayo Lloyd Phillips you have 90 seconds thank you Paul certainly been an uh, interesting debate uh, or discussion more, more than the debate but uh, well the community has a choice to make now we have um, four candidates I think uh, three of us have uh, a lot of similarities I'll be honest you know uh, and I think uh, the jobs that were done in the past by uh, by Joe Norton 24 years as Grand Chief Mike DeLilla as, as 11 I had an opportunity to work with both of them for eight years each I've seen different styles I've seen different uh, ways of going about doing stuff, doing business. Well, I'm not Mike DeLille, and I'm not Joe Norton. I'm Lloyd Phillips. I'm a respectful person. I'm open to new ideas, new ways of moving forward. I want to instill a vision in our community. Take that vision that's already created, add to it, put the hall behind it, and show our community moves forward. To me, it's not about the past. It's not about the present. It's about the future, and I want to be part of that future. Lloyd Phillips, thank you very much. Mike DeLille. I've been your Grand Chief for the past 11 years. I believe I've served proudly. I believe I've represented the community in the most positive light possible. There's been trying times. There's been very good times. I think we've accomplished a lot, not only in the, in the 11 years, but as long as Council has been in play. We still receive some blame for things as far back as Seaway, understandably so, if council had a role in it in some way, shape, or form. Not looking for pats on the back, not looking for job well done. Um, I think that comes internally. You know, family, friends, the, the circle of influence that you speak to, speak with, and are spoken to by, obviously have your ear, you have theirs, and in most cases are of like mind. But to run this community, as diverse as it is, as independent as it wants to be, as determined as it wants to be, and, and I'll say as, as, as stubborn, you know, the word gayo comes to mind a lot of times, but stubbornness has merit as well. And like I said, I'm, I'm selfish for Ganawage. I want to see the best for my community. Lived here my whole life. Yeah, I worked outside here and there and what have you, but this is home. I'm not going anywhere. I'd never do anything to the detriment of my community, whether it's to my children, my grandchildren, my family, or anyone else. I, I view and value Gunawage as my extended family and hope to continue to have your support. Yaungoa. 
Thank you, Mike DeLill. In fact, thank you to all four of our candidates for Grand Chief uh, for coming in and keeping this a respectful debate tonight. And uh, it's something that we, I know, would like to do. And the community is uh, hungering for more by all of the ongoings on social media tonight and uh, a lot of the questions that were called in from the public. I apologize that we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, we did filter them through our journalists in the other room. And a big thank you to uh, our panel of journalists from the Eastern Door editor, publisher Steve Bonspiel from Mohawk TV, Gatnawagi411.com Media, executive producer Regan Jacobs from Yoriwase and Gatnawagi News.com, editor, publisher Greg Horn, and from Ganadagu TV, channel coordinator Lauren McCumber. Uh, again, thank you, Mike DeLil, Keith Mayo, Joe Norton and Lloyd Phillips for coming in this evening and uh, giving us two hours. And I know that it would have been very easy to make this three, four, five and a half hours even, just like last <laughs> week at the candidates' night. But uh, very much appreciated. And best of luck to all of you on Saturday. K103 News. Thank you, we'll Thank you Paul. K103 News will be uh, at the forefront of uh, reporting that and having results for you Monday morning uh, on the uh, on the morning show between 6 and 9 a.m. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us uh, this evening for the grand debate, a first venture between all of the Gatnawage journalists, and a big thank you to everyone. Nyawagoa, thank you for listening, and we'll catch you later on K103 Gatnawage. Good night. Good night. Good night.